So, the efforts we'll be concentrating on here is, are the following. You can see that they've got different names that are located in different parts. So, we, we, we saw in the visual system, um, you can it figured out edges, it figured, figured out textures, you could read letters. We'll see the same thing happens here, and we just saw a demonstration of that. So with these five receptors types, all that the, um, Vaishu did um, was accomplished by them. The first one is this thing that, that called the Pacinian corpuscle, or Pacinian receptor. And it's a, a nerve fiber, and it has this sort of onion skin sort of embedded over one end of it. And, and it has layers. So when something presses on the skin, it gets pressed before. And if it gets pressed a lot, the deformation becomes a lot. When the deformation happens, this little channel opens up in this receptor, allowing sodium into the cell, and that raises the voltage inside the cell. And then if the voltage is big enough, and it, the big enough has to occur here where it's sort of wider, um, that it's called the initial segment, um, it, it starts going down the, the nerve. And you notice that when it hits these yellow round things, which is called myelin, it's sort of an insulator that goes around the nerve. Um, it starts hopping from one uninsulated part to the next uninsulated part. And that increases the speed with which these, uh, this information can be transmitted to the brain. So without the myelin, uh, transmission is slower and poorer. And one of the, not that you don't need to know for the exam, but one of the problems people with MS have is that this myelin starts breaking down. And so the conduction down along nerves breaks down. And um, they have trouble uh, feeling and they have trouble generating movement. Okay. Now, you saw there that, that um, a small thing, nothing happens. A bigger thing, one thing happens. And for a large thing, three things happen. So each time uh, the pressure increased, this voltage inside the afferent increased. And if it was big enough over this threshold, action potentials occurred. So here, because of it's over this threshold for a longer time, three action potentials occurred. For the little smaller one, just a single action potential occurred. The other thing to note is that the signal adapts. That is, it starts becomes, even though the pressure remains constant, the signal adapts. So the voltage starts dropping within this afferent. And all your afferents have this uh, property that they adapt. Some fast and some slow. We'll use RA for rapidly adapting and SA for slow, slow adapting. This is a fast one this app, the particular afferent, the Persinian. Um, the other thing that happens is that the amount of oxygen potentials increases with pressure, but eventually it, the, the oxygen potential uh, starts, stops increasing as much. So a, 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 a small change here will produce a larger change in oxygen potential than the chain, same change up here. So that's called saturation. And you'll, you'll hopefully, when you look at the problems, um, not uh, the, the next week, you'll see there's a good reason for that.
Now, why it adapts, or how it adapts, I should say, is that these onion skin, onion skin lamina, they, they get deformed by the pressure, but then when the pressure stays on, they sort of creep back to their original shape. And when they creep back to the original shape, this, uh, the stretch on this afferent decreases and the sodium flowing in decreases. Why it adapts is, is that, for example, touch, you, you, you're, and all the, the, the sensory system, they want to know when something changes. They want to detect that. So they don't, you don't care about the pressure that your clothes have on your skin throughout the day. You just want to know if that pressure changes. Now we have, as I said, five types of afferent, but on any particular skin, part of the skin, we just have four. That's because there are two types of areas on your skin, one with hair and one without. On the one with hair, we have these, your hair cells sticking out, and around them you have afferents, and whenever they get bent, you feel that your hair got bent. On the other hand, if you look at the palm side of your hand, you see that there's no skin. And, and instead you have this receptacle, the Meissner receptor. And then you have all the, uh, these other four. So on any one part of the skin, you have only four. Now, they're also divided up into ones that adapt and ones that adapt quickly, ones that adapt slowly. And the interesting thing is that on each part of the skin, so the, there's the surface or the deeper parts of the skin, uh, you have both the slowly adapting or the rapidly adapting. This one's rapidly, this one's slowly. This one's rapidly, this, this one's slowly, okay? Now, the other thing that varies with depth is the size of the receptor field. So you can see that um, this one here, RA1, with the one denoting that it's on the skin surface, uh, has a small receptor field. This other one, RA2, um, uh, is deeper in skin, and it has uh, larger receptive fields. So just to uh, summarize, I won't be using those names, those complicated names of things. We'll be remembering what the receptive types are by this RA1 or uh, SA1, SA1 or SA2 nomenclature. I have a lot of trouble remembering names, and so I much prefer something like that. So remember back in the uh, first lecture, we saw that uh, with your three types of cones, you could distinguish between 22 million types of colors. And so here we have five receptor types or four in any one part. So you can um, um, tell as many different types of things about objects as you can with the visual system. You can tell possibly as many or if not more things. And if you only had one rather than five types, it'd be like being colorblind. You know, you could be a lot of nuances of a picture that you would be unable to see because you couldn't tell, you know, the different, all the different combinations that you could see with five different types. Like, uh, this number drops dramatically if instead of three receptors we just have one. Because they, 
they sort of has a multiplicative effect. Besides touch, we can do other th sense other things um, in the skin. One thing is paint. Um, there are two types of paint fibers. One fast, which is bigger, and one slow, which is smaller. The fast one is myelinated, so it sends information quickly down to the brain. And it gives you a sense of intense localized pain. So it's when something strikes you. This, on the other hand, is unmyelinated, and so it sends it to make it slowly. It comes down much later. And it is this throbbing type of pain. It's poorly localized, and it's long-lasting. It's sort of a dull pain. Um, often, you, your, um, your hand falls asleep because of pressure on the nerves. And the pressure um, blocks mostly um, the larger fibers. And those are mostly the ones um, signaling touch and not pain or temperature. Okay. And so when you lose the sense of touch, you often still maintain the sense of pain. Now, the sense of pain is controlled by something called the gate control theory, which two scientists in McGill came up with many decades ago. And they um, postulated that your sensation of pain is dependent by, uh, upon a balance between how much signals coming from your large nerves, that is your touch nerves, versus your small nerves, your pain nerves. And um, so if there's more large than small, then you don't sense pain, where it's the ob ob converse, then you start sensing pain. And for that reason, uh, rubbing on something, rubbing the skin of something that's painful, some area that's painful, can help mask the pain. The other type of receptor that you have is temperature receptor. You've got um, receptors that prefer, <laughs> start active, becoming active when something's cold, and another type of receptor that's active when something is hot. And um, freezing is out here beyond the temperature of your cold receptor. And when something's freezing, then your pain and effort start acting up. And okay, so you've got all these signals coming to the brain. Let's for a moment just concentrate on the ones coming from touch. So these these um, signals going down, and um, the brain is receiving this effort coming signaling to it that something's happening. How does the brain know what it is that's happening? It just knows that something's firing. How does it know what the stimulus is? Like it could be that uh, what's happening is something's poking, vibrating on the skin and producing this stream of action potentials. Or it could be that something is pressing on the skin, and it's pressing something that's slowly adapting, and uh, so you feel, again, this long train of efforts. It could be something that's on the small, and it's on the surface of the skin, or it could be something that's big, deep in the skin. Those are the, all the possibilities, and it's producing the same action potential to the brain. So how does the brain know what's happening? So you've got all these afferents, and which one is it? Somehow, 
it's managing to develop something like a labeled line for each athlete. And that, that labeled line is something like the problem you have when you're on the internet. Uh, when somebody's sending a signal down the internet, um, it gets encoded with, um, a, with a tag or label as to who is, is that sending it. And then it goes down the internet, and that internet gets screamed to whoever you want to talk to, and that person knows by the label you put on your message who it's from. Well, the brain's got to do something similar. But the advantage the brain, the way the brain does it, is not by having a little color code here as to who it's coming from. It's by having a different line for each type of effort. Okay, That's somewhat remarkable because that's a lot of lines. We, we use these fiber optic cables for the internet and we pack everyone's message down the same line. But the brain has used a very different type of solution. And, and so you need this thick spinal cord to send the signal up to the brain and tell it, uh, e giving each type of athlete its own little message, its own little line. So somehow from this different, different lines, it learns that this line gets active, if this line is active, then it's a vibration from the skin surface. And I managed to tap this thing for when I emphasized my sentence and not when I <laughs> moved to the next page. So, and that's takes a while to put your mind around that. Um, we'll see later in the lecture that um, the auditory system has the same type of coding. You hear you hear a certain frequency of, of a violin plays a certain sound, or a drum he, 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 uh, plays a certain sound, and that activates afferent. But it's not the frequency of that afferent that codes that it's a drum or a violin. It's which afferent it is. And the brain, if this is the afferent, then a drum is playing. If this is the afferent, then a violin is playing. The same thing here. The, which afferent it is is important. So let's look at what each of these afferents could signal. If this afferent is firing, then the, the brain, through experience, you know, long, young kids start feeling things and sees that, you know, uh, this, this is this object and this produces this afferent. And after a while, he rec starts recognizing that this is a smooth surface and has, you know, or this is a rough surface. So this is a localized flutter. So this, an insect has landed on my skin. This is a very fine vibration. Um, and that we'll see in a moment is very useful in texture. Okay? But note that it's a rapidly adapting thing. So it's... It, uh, because it's rapidly adapting, uh, it, 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 uh, it, you need to, to vibrate it to have it send out a continuous string of action potentials. This one here is slowly adapting, and so it's firing for a long time, but it's useful to tell, it's on the surface of skin, so it could be useful to tell edges, like this edge is round. When, when Vaishu was picking up things, the, the roundness of an object, she could tell by the activity of this receptor. This receptor here um, is a deep in the skin, and it's slowly adapting, so it's active for a long time. And it's useful to determine what, how much the skin has stretched. And 
that becomes very important for something like the hand, to be able to know what your finger position is. One of the cues the hand uses is to see how much the, 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 the skin, let's say if I curl my, my hand the, on, on the palm side of the hand, I'm compressing the skin, and on the opposite side of my hand, I'm stretching the skin. And from that, I can determine that my hand is curled. Okay? And my brain can signal, and by how much exactly. So I can tell that it's a dime and not a quarter, all kinds of things. And finally here, this, this is deep again, it's rapidly adapting. So it's something tapping, you know, a, a pencil is tapping my, my hand or I'm holding something that's vibrating like a power tool. Now, let's, let's see texture, okay? I don't have sandpaper here, but we have desks. But the other thing that's good is, is your shirt. Rub, rub your, your fingertips over your shirt, okay? You will be able to tell the texture. Now stop rubbing, just leave them here. Can you tell the texture? No, because these are, these are rapidly adapting efforts. You have to move it back and forth to be able to tell the little fine differences in texture on your shirt. Okay. So how does the signal get to the brain? Well, it gets to the brain through this, this is your afferent, and it goes to, to the spinal cord, and then up right here, which is about the neck level, or just when the neck becomes you know, the wider part of the brain, called the dorsal column nucleus. Makes a synapse there, and then crosses over to the other side, hits the thalamus, again, every afferent hits the thalamus, and finally gets to the cortex, and here we'll see that each part of the cortex represents a different part of your skin. And this is the arm area of your skin. Now notice that this is the arm area on, on this case, from my point of view, this is the left arm. And this is going to the right cortex. Okay? So it's like the visual system. Uh, everything in the left visual field goes to the right side of the brain. The other thing that happens is that as it goes up, the signal goes up to the spinal cord, it takes up different parts of the um, back of the spinal cord. Um, here it's on the medial side, but the trunk comes in a little more lateral to it, and then when the arm signal comes in, it's a little lateral to that. So you can hear, see here that within the spinal cord, you're starting to get a map of your skin. The whole skin is being laid out in different parts of your spinal cord. And so then it hit, makes a synapse here at uh, the dorsal column, the, 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 this is a repetition of what we had before. Then there's another part, pathway, for transmission of pain. Now the key difference here is before the afferent went up and the first synapse that it made was up here in the, above the neck region, dorsal column nucleus. For the case of pain, it makes a synapse in the spinal cord itself at the level it comes in and then crosses over to the opposite side and then joins the other afferent in the thalamus and then joins the other afferent in the brain. Okay. Now, question then is uh, what happens in, in this first synapse, the structure here? dorsal column nucleus. 
Now, anatomists consider this as a relay nucleus. That's the name they give for it. But the relay nucleus sort of implies that nothing happens. Nothing different occurs. But a lot of important differences occur. The signal coming out of here is a very different signal that comes in here. And we'll see what those differences are in the next couple of slides. The first thing that happens is convergence. So here we see the back of the skin, and there's the afferents, and you can see that a lot of afferents are converging onto this one dorsal column nucleus cell. Okay, so this large area of skin will be represented by a small part of this DCN. As a consequence of this convergence, um, you, you won't be able to tell accurately where on the skin one is being pressed, which part of the skin one is being pressed from. It's hard to tell from over here to over here. In contrast, another part of your skin, the tip toe of your fingers, have a very different pattern. Here, each afferent will have its own DCN neuron to synapse onto, or a few of them, not, not, not one probably, but a few of them compared to what you had before. And so the fingertip is like your fovea. It requires a large number of DCN neurons to represent it, like you had in the visual system. And because of that, you can tell fine features with your fingertips, like Raishu did. So she could tell fine detail with her fingertips. If I had her do something, something similar with her elbow, she would have a lot of trouble. <laughs> Or even more with the back. Okay. So, one other function of the DCN is to compare what's happening in the center versus what's happening on, on the surround. So, you ha start getting um, uh, inhibitory surrounds. You can see here that there's some afferents here that go to this DCN neuron that all have excitatory input into it. And then other afferents located around the center get connected through other DCN neurons to the same neuron, providing inhibitory input. And that gives you this inhibitory surround that you saw in ganglion cells, okay, producing in the eye. Um, and if the purpose of this, this inhibitory surround was to um, define edges better. So it's, it helped you see where the edges of your visual system are. Well, the same thing happens here. It accentuates the edges that you feel when you touch an object, where the edge of the coin was, and whether that edge is round or goes straight. And it, it enhances this thing called two-point discrimination, which is what I did with that, uh, uh, those, those, those two points that I applied to the skin. The other thing that, that, that's interesting is that um, it's hard to tickle yourself. Okay, I don't know if you're right tickling yourself, but the <laughs> reason people... <laughs> okay, I don't know if I have that tickle spot, but, but I, yeah, I, uh, other people have to tickle you. And, and the reason is, is, is there, there's an explanation for it, whether it's true or not. Um, I'm not quite sure, but one has output from the cortex that um, inhibits neurons in your DCM. And so whenever you move, okay, those neurons, th those connections can inhibit signals coming up. And sometimes that's useful. 
for example, when I pick up something like a mouse, I don't want the signals coming from my afferents to signal signal things because you know I, I, I'm I want to do do the picking up. So there are times when um, this inhibitory signal is useful. So we saw that there are three transformations happening in your DCN. It's not a real leg nucleus. It's a, you can differentiate by convergence. You can differentiate by lateral inhibition. And um, it's different because of the choir discharge that gates what kind of input heads up to the cortex. Now, what happens when it gets to the cortex? Well, um, it goes to an area called the, the somatosensory cortex. And one particular region here is this strip of neurons that you see in orange here. And you can see that this strip represents all the skin surface all over your body. From your legs over on this side your tongue over on this side. And it's distorted, you know, so your your trunk is hardly visible here um, on, on this map. Hard, hard to recognize where your trunk is. But you see huge fingertips and you see a, a big face area and even larger, a, a very large tongue area. The tongue area is as big as your thumb area. Now, phantom limbs. Um, when you get, get uh, um, for some reason, you lose a limb, uh, you sometimes get this phantom limb sensation. And one patient, when he uh, had a, a limb removed, his arm amputated uh, up to the shoulder level, uh, after a year or so, he started getting a sensation of a hand sensation of his hand in his face region. And why was that? Well, as after he lost his hand, the face area took over uh, the arm area, but left this tiny little part of it in a, a small part of the face. Okay. So the face didn't take over everything it left a small part. And so he had a sensation still of his hand within the face. That tells you that um, there's a lot of plasticity that can occur in your somatosensory cortex, and probably um, in areas around it as well, even in adulthood. Now, So the area that we saw here, the skin surface, that whole map of the whole, whole skin of the whole body, is laid down along here. And here you see the fingertips being laid out. It's an area called 3B. And this is part of S1. Another part of S1 that we'll study next week um, is this area 3A, which uh, receives information from the things underneath the skin, your muscles, your joints. And it helps you tell where the position of your body is, where, you know, what, what, what the orientation of your body is, whether your um, elbow is flexed, extended, uh, I guess, whereas the, the part we're taking up today, area three bay, tells you what's happening on the surface of the elbow, whereas the other part tells you what's happening with the elbow itself, its position. And again, the, this is posterior, this is anterior. This part here is the central sulcus, the thing that divides the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. And so together, these areas, 3A and 3B, become S1, and this S1 is like the B1. 
um, the, your primary sim, 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 primary sensory area for touch. Now, one of the things that happens is that um, you get mirroring. So you see this this uh, hand here. It projects to an area called one behind here, like V1 goes to V2. And you can see that this hand is mirrored in this area here. Again, for the same purposes as uh, it, it is in, in, in v, v, V2. So the afferents can be shorter in length. Not the afferents, the connection between V1 and V2 could be good. The other thing that happens is that, okay, different afferents get gets represented. So here we have primarily the RA1 afferents from the skin so that rapidly adapted, adapting ones. And you can remember, these are the ones that are important for texture. When you felt the surface of your a sweater, wherever it was, um, this is the part that was telling you whether it was rough or smooth. This area here um, is from the slowly adapting ones, and so the slowly adapting ones tell you whether it's, this, the skin is being stretched or compressed, and it's telling you more what the shape of the thing that you're holding is. So it tells you what the shape of the hand is, and from that you can tell whether the thing is small or large. The other thing you can tell that's different is over here, these, the, the receptive fields are like the DCN ones. They're circular surround. When you move up to this area, they become elongated. And when they become elongated, they, they're detecting the orientation of an edge. The other thing they, they become is they can span several fingers, so the same afferent, uh, the same um, um, firing here in the cortex represents the activity coming across several fingers. And the last thing that, that, that you can detect is the, the speed of movement across these fingers. So most Whereas the ones, early ones, can only circular surround and don't have any of those. So finally, the signal gets back here, and back here, is, we'll just say the parietal cortex is a big place for now, and we'll take up more of it next week. But it, it's worth stereognosis. So finally, when Vaishu picked up the object and identified what it was, that's what she was using. Now, if you look at area uh, 3B, um, this is where you find those label lines ending. So each of those uh, uh, fibers going up the spinal cord, each one signifying the firing a different type of afferent. Well, these end up in different columns. So this one, the, the, the an rapidly adapting uh, the thing from the skin surface, ends up in this column, a slowly adapting one over here, deeper in the skin to here, deeper in the skin, but rapidly adapting over here. So each one of these columns represents a different afferent. And so with time, a child learns to identify the fiery of each of these columns as a different um, color of object, you know, or, or color, something like color, as a different color. Okay, we go to taste and then smell. Hopefully I can do that just ra relatively rapidly. I could stop now for a little bit, but I, I think I prefer to keep going and it won't take too long. So the, the tongue here, you can see the tongue with different colors on it. And those colors represent the different modalities of taste that you could 
um, you can taste. So you can taste bitter, sour, sweet, this thing called umami, and at different parts of the tongue, mostly on around the edges of the tongue and less down the middle. Um, you all know what bitter is and what sour is and what sweet is, but this other, and salty, um, but you may not know umami and a few people, at, um, if you read a book maybe 15 years ago, you would have read that there's only um, uh, five, four types of afferents in, in, on the tongue. Like recently they found umami uh, and no doubt if you read a textbook 10 to 15 years from now, it'll be a few more. Umami is the, as we'll find out, is, is the taste of bacon. That's how you, the, why bacon tastes really good. Or cheese. So um, the, the interesting thing is, so that if we t imagine taking a sip, a sip of wine, you know, the first afferents get activated over here and gradually uh, our sensations head back to here, you know, and you get this cascade of receptors that gets activated. And it's this cascade of afferents that get activated that tells you what the, what the taste is. Um, so it's not the signal at any one time, but it's this cascade over different parts of the tongue. Now the receptors themselves, they're um, sourness or saltiness is just an ion going through a channel. You know, it's either hydrogen, which is how acidy something is, or sodium going through, directly through a channel that tells you what, what, what those two pull it. The other things require uh, a more complex um, receptor. And those receptors involve um, G protein coupled receptors. And that has a cascade effect, similar to the cascade effect that occurs within the retina. Um, and finally, this umami, um, it's activated by, for one thing, monosodium glutamate. And that's why you tend to add it and other amino acids. And so it is what gives bacon its savory taste and, and cheeses its different flavors. Now each receptor, you can think of it as um, a, uh, being a key. And the uh, no, each receptor is like the lock of a key. Um, and and the, the 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 molecules or um, ions uh, have to fit into this particular lock to open it. And uh, a lot of the studies in something like the artificial sweetness um, industry is to find uh, a non molecule that fits the the lock that uh, uh, gets activated by sweetness. Now, these receptors are located on these cells. And each one is sensitive to a different type of modality, or one of the five takes. The takes. So this one can be sweetness, this one can be saltiness. And because the tongue is a hazardous place to be, you can, you're eating all kinds of really hot foods and it, it, uh, things that are abrasive. Um, it's being constantly replaced. So new cells uh, develop. 
but these new cells require an afferent. So if the nerve was cut, these cells would die because they need some sort of supporting mole molecule that's being transmitted down this afferent. These afferents then go to the brain. And in the first place, they go along these three different nerves that, are, that make synapses here in the nucleus of the solitary tract, and then here in the thalamus, and then finally here in this part of the cortex. And again, they use some, a similar coding to touch of a labeled line system that uh, gives you a sense of touch. Um, what I didn't mention is that besides being able to taste, which is a chemical analysis, the tongue is very good at all the afferents that your skin is good at, you know, so it can tell cold, pain, uh, pain being the hot spice that you add, uh, and, and all the touch that you feel with your hand. Also, uh, inside the cortex, you have sort of hungers. Uh, you have preferences for certain tastes. And um, you have a craving for salty food. You have a craving for uh, food that has, has an umami taste because that provides you all all the amino acids and proteins that you need. And also you need sugar, so you have a craving for sugar. Um, there's also afferents get activated at the back of the tongue, the sourness and the um, taste, for example, that get activated by um, things that, that, that uh, um, you don't want to eat. The other thing is in terms of uh, inboard hunger is um, uh, an example of it was, was lead poisoning in children. Now, one of the things that, that uh, you need is calcium. And you might not realize it, but if you don't get enough calcium, you get a hunger for calcium. And you know, young children, um, many decades ago, um, didn't have vitamins or things that they supplement the, the intake of calcium or didn't have to eat enough cheese or drink enough milk. Uh, they develop a craving for it and study e eating the plaster off the wall, which contains a lot of calcium. But unfortunately, the walls at that time were painted with lead paint and they would then develop lead poisoning. You have also genetic difference, those, those uh, um, things that allow you to detect umami, sourness, um, all require uh, genes in their receptors to be activated. And different, you can have, uh, like we had in the receptors for um, color, um, you can have a deficiency in a certain gene and not be able, in this case, not be able to detect a certain taste that some people don't, can't detect the, the, the bitterness of cabbage. Uh, you can also learn aversions to taste. Um, as I mentioned, animals that usually have uh, innate um, uh, aversions to, to bitterness and sourness. That's because it's usually accompanied by foods that are either poisonous or um, spoiled. Um, but if uh, you try to uh, uh, get rid of rats, for example, with a tasteless poison, um, they develop nausea as, as they go from eat once they eat, eat even a small amount of this poisoning. And so they get a aversion for any food associated with that poison. This aversion lasts a lifetime. Um, Similarly, when you go to a restaurant and eat something that causes you to get sick from, you develop an aversion to the taste of that food. But it's not quite like 
classic conditioning because you don't get aversion, and aver you don't develop an aversion to the music that was being played in that restaurant at the same time or to the people that you were with at the same time. So you just, it's specific to the, only the food that you eat. Smell. Smell involves these afferents at the top of your nose here. And they uh, depend on molecules that enter your nose and then settle on the mu mucus that is present at the very top of your nose. Um, the combination of taste and smell is important for giving you its sense of flavor. With age, these receptors become less active, and when they become less active, it de depletes your, or it lessens your um, want to eat, and you be become, can become um, um, overly not eat enough. Now, you can see here these molecules uh, of, of floating around from the different smells. These individual molecules that are floating around are odorants. That's the name for the molecules. And they all have a different shape. And you can see that the afferent also has a different shape for its receptor. In this case, there are ones that are triangular shaped, ones that are square in shape, and ones that are circular in shape, given different colors. There's three of them drawn here. You have something like 300 on the back, on the top of your, each of your nasal cavities. And each of these are embedded in this mucus. So an after this order and comes, it gets attached to the mucus and then dissolves into it and then activates the afferent, which you can see the cell here in the middle and these protuberance of different shapes um, being the key to, to the lock or the, the, the lock that the, the afferent fits into. Now, over here at the top is bone, so there's little channels in the bone, bone that these afferents pass through to get to here, the olfactory bulb, which is part of the brain. And in here you have microcells, each one of which are given different color. Now, if you, this is the brain, and if you have a sudden impact, this part of the brain can move forward or backwards. And the problem with that is it can easily shear this afferent. And so, as a consequence, you can lose your ability um, to, to, to smell things after a concussion. The other thing is that, like, like taste cells, um, the, these, this is a, a very... Um, dangerous area to be, you can have all kinds of infections in your nose, and so these cells can die, and they have to be replaced. And again, like taste cells, they're replaced over a very relatively rapid period of time, a month or so. From there, they go to other parts of the cortex. Um, one of these is the piriform cortex, which combines signals to give you mixtures of, of smells. You can detect a particular perfume. And then it goes to amygdala, an important part of the brain that tells you whether something's pleasant or unpleasant. And that amygdala is used for unpleasant sights, unpleasant um, all kinds of unpleasant things. Then, then we'll see, it also goes to the hippocampus, which is studied in detail in the last lecture. It's a structure that's important in coding memories. So you remember uh, a smell. And finally, it settles in this orbital frontal cortex, which analyzes the smell.
So the middle is a pleasant versus unpleasant, and the catalyst is the membranes. The orofrontal cortex is the place where you get co you combine not only smell, but taste, and also what you see. Um, so you, the sight of an apple will activate uh, a, a cell in the orofrontal cortex. Um, the smell of, 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 of the same thing and the taste the same thing. If you get a lesion here, you have trouble discriminating different smells. Okay. Again, th these, these afferents here are unmyelinated, and that's, it totally transmits information slowly, but that's not a problem because everything here occurs slowly. Um, these molecules have to go through the mucus, dissolve into it. Um, your, your, the whiffs you take, you take over a period of time. So you inhale, and there's a stream of little molecules going down here, uh, getting attached. So um, it's why memories, the analysis through memory, is important to be distinguishing this. Now, are there sort of basic taste qualities? You know, like we saw in vision, we had three types of cones. Um, in touch, we had five different receptors. In here, there's no basic receptor type. We have something like 500, so I've drawn three here, but there's 500 different receptor types that, that are located for smell. Uh, and in, in, in uh, other animals, like dogs, there could be thousands and thousands of thousands of receptor types. We've stopped using smell as an important um, distinguishing feature, so we've gradually diminished the number of receptor types we have. Now, you can see here that, that um, this molecule here can fit into the round-shaped uh, receptors, but it, it's this end here can also fit into the square end of receptors. So this fits into the round, this fits into the square. Similarly over here, round and square. Or have I got a oh, I can, the triangular and square versus round and square. So, um, and these go up to your microcells, and your microcells then produce a map of different the activity of different receptor types. So rather than having um, a topological map of your skin surface, you've got a topological map of different smells along the, the, your olfactory bulb. Again, you can have genetic defects, so you can kind of have something akin to color blindness. In this case, is given the strange name of anosamia. I think I got the pronunciation right. Okay, so here again we have um, these afferents coming in. We've got green ones, all the green ones concentrating. To this one microcell, and these blue ones here concentrated on this. So we, each area of your olfactory bulb is given, becoming, developing into a, a different map of different smells. So if, if the, again, these are, can be damaged and they re rejuvenate over a period of a month from basal cells. But the amazing thing is that the basal cells then 
let's say this cell gets damaged. It then develops an axon that grows to the same afferent, that, the same microcell that the original cell came from. So this mapping doesn't become disruptive. So the yellow ones, if they get damaged for some reason, they grow back to this, this yellow microcell. The blue ones go back to the blue microcell. So the same mapping and therefore memory of smells is maintained. And lastly, then, if we compare taste smell, they both have similar qualities. We, see, we saw that olfactory cells and taste cells um, are constantly being replenished because of possible damage. We also see that both taste and smell project to the newer parts of the cortex. The orbofrontal cortex is a newer part of the cortex. But they also go to something called the limbic areas of your cortex, the old you know, parts that are present in, in uh, lizards and in fish. And these are the things that, that are useful for um, giving you pleasure or storing memories. And I think. That's it for today, yes.